This program is made possible by Zoho Corporation. Hello and welcome. I'm Kamla. Today my guest is Vinod Dham. He's an engineer inventor, entrepreneur, and an investor. Some of you may know him as father of the Pentium chip. He has worked in the tech industry for 40 years, and 16 of them were at Intel, which is where you made your mark as father of the Pentium processor. Welcome. Thank you. What does it mean, father of the Pentium processor? I don't know who came up with that uh, coinage, but uh, it really, to me, always implied that somebody who uh, started the development of the program and took it to its fruition. The, and the chip was, before that, the chips were known by their numbers, 386, 486. That's right. That's right. That's right. The chip prior to that was Intel 486, which also I had stepped in to complete in middle of its development and taken it to uh, make a successful business out of. And prior to that, I was also involved with 386, not the original one, but the uh, second version of it. So what was different about the Pentium chip? Again, uh, the fundamental difference in all these chips was more integration of functionality and features, plus, most importantly, the speed, the performance. Because back then, we were trying to build Ferraris, and now they're trying to build Priuses. So tell us, how did your interest in science and math start? I think math, I, I, I think I had inherent interest. Uh, it turns out my grandfather was a, an accountant and very good in math. So a lot of my was siblings... Was it Munimji, as they would say in he India? Was, yeah, he was under British uh, Raj, um, one of the well-off people who kept their accounting. And so was his brother, who was actually an accountant to the Maharaja of uh, 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 Kashmir, uh, you know, which is uh, uh, all the trouble that got created there, the Hindu Maharaja. So I think the math was in the genes. I, I, I can see that around my uh, nephews, nieces as well. Uh, the interest in physics really came from uh, when I was a teenager in Delhi. Uh, the past time was to go to the North Place and uh, couldn't afford much. We didn't have enough money. But on the footpaths, which you will call, call here sidewalks, they would sell these popular mechanic and different kinds of books, and I'll pick them up for, you know, pittance, uh, maybe a dime or a nickel, and read them. And that's where really my fascination for space, research, and physics came. This was the time also when the race to land a man on the moon Absolutely. was... Absolutely. It's in the mid-60s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you developed an interest in physics, but then you ended up doing engineering. That was really accidental. I'm an accidental engineer. I really never uh, wanted to be an engineer, to be very honest with you. My interest was physics. I had enrolled. I had done very well in my exams, and so I got into the best colleges in Delhi University for my physics uh, honors. It was my brother, I have three brothers, other brothers, and it was uh, one of them who's a uh, physician who basically talked me into doing engineering and in fact forced me into doing engineering because he <laughs> felt that uh, just doing physics will not uh, commercially be very viable in terms of making a lot of money. So this thinking about uh, in, in Indian families that you should do medicine or engineering goes way back, huh? Way back, absolutely. They not only wanted you to be educated, but they wanted to be educated in an area where you can make some money. Where you'd be gainfully employed. Exactly. Okay. So, and you, yours is an unusual story, and it's also a textbook case in some ways, because the textbook case is how you've become successful. The unusualness, at least the way I look at it is, Usually, kids in India, after they finish college, they came straight to the U.S., but you took a four-year detour where you worked and discovered your passion for solid-state physics and for the hardware industry and then decided to come here. So you worked, after you graduated, you worked for four years in a spin-off of Teradyne in New Delhi, which is unusual. Very true. I think what happened was uh, I'm the youngest in my family. I, we are four brothers and a sister. In fact, I'm the only one who's born in free India today. They're all refugees from Pakistan. And uh, so my, as you know, in an Indian family, the youngest one has the responsibility to look after the parents. Mm. So I do recall having brought the subject up to my parents about coming to America just when I graduated. But it was very quickly thrown out of the window because who would take care of us mm. was the answer. And we were quite uh, obedient, if you remember, back in our era. And, I didn't even think twice about it and didn't regret it or cry about it. And I said, fine. And I went on to 
work at Continental Devices and went my merry way till I again ran into a roadblock of trying to understand what semiconductors are in my day-to-day -day life of working, things will happen that I won't understand why they happen, is when my boss said, you need to go get a degree, PhD, or a master's in solid state science to really understand what goes on in these devices. Did he say come to the US? He absolutely said come to the US. He was very specific. He himself had worked in Philips Semiconductor in uh, Holland uh, and knew enough about this industry and where the best education was. He specifically said come to the United States. And what was his name? His name, uh, we called him uh, Mr. Madan, but his full name was S.S. Madan. That stood for Surinder Singh Madan. So then you come to the U.S. and you applied to schools. Again, an accident. You couldn't have come to Berkeley, but you ended up in Ohio. Oh, I mean, the, it was a pretty straightforward decision in our family. We, my father was a man of modest means. He didn't have a lot of money. Uh, Berkeley offered me admission, but did not offer me assistantship. Uh, Cincinnati offered me both free tuition and assistantship, so it was black and white. And on top of that, I do recall there was a funny anecdote, that is my father, you know, being a retired person, would read every day the entire newspaper, Times of India, as you know, was multiple pages of it, back to back, and uh, had this, uh, uh, I didn't know about it, uh, had, uh, shared with me that Berkeley was really a place where there was a lot of protests from students, and there was, uh, turmoil going on because of the Vietnamese war. I wasn't much aware of any of that, to be really honest with you. And uh, when the Cincinnati people offered me, none of us knew where Cincinnati, or even for that matter, Ohio was. And uh, we didn't even have a map at our home at that time to really go look up and say, where is this place? I recall going to Connaught Place to uh, this bookshop called Gurgurti and Sons and picking up uh, for first time a international map, bringing it home, and very, very, all of us were all crowding around it to looking for Cincinnati, Ohio. And when we finally found it, my dad making a comment that uh, it's great, uh, it must be a safe place because nobody knows where it is. <laughs> So you land in Cincinnati, and what was your first day like? Oh my gosh, the first day was not good at all. Uh, I uh, had taken a flight uh, f uh, from Delhi to London, and London to uh, New York, and then there was a helicopter. Which, which airplane? Which airline? Uh, so Pan Am airline. Okay. And then from New York, uh, there was a helicopter uh, ride to LaGuardia, mm. and this flight to Cincinnati only, I guess, back then was probably coming from Bagardi Airport for whatever reason. I never really tried to rationalize it. And towards the tail end of the flight, I did feel a little bit uh, sick, you know, and they have these bags for you. And the two guys sitting on either side of me were very helpful in, in the whole process. But when I landed, my bag never arrived. And you know how precious that is. You yes. come from India for the first time, you're even in a plane, and your mom has prepared all these special clothes for you and things. And, and my typical reaction was what we would do in India. That is, when I reached Cincinnati and my bag never arrived on the belt, I just uh, checked in with the people. They said, oh, you know what? It's left in New York and will come at 4 o'clock in the morning and we'll deliver it wherever you want it to be delivered. And my first reaction was just to sit there. And, <laughs> and it was already very late, and I wanted to lie down on those seats at the airport. And they came up to me, and they said, no, no, we, we don't want you to really stay here and spend the night at the airport. Just go, and uh, we will make sure that you get your bags. So you came without your bags? Yes. OK. So, I had a similar experience. I, yeah. My bags didn't come, too. And that's, you know, first day that happening is a little bit. Uh, did you know anybody at all in Ohio? No, I did not. Although, uh, so my roommate turned out to be somebody I had known who had worked with me before in India. But he was in India at that time. And he gave me the, he told me to go collect the key from her student, who is now a good friend and became my roommate. Uh, and I remember it turned out to be a Friday evening, and I didn't have any concept of what Fridays are in this country, so-called big weekends. And uh, I arrive around 7, 7.30, and I make myself into the hall, because hallways in Cincinnati have double doors, because it's a very cold country, as you know. And so you've opened the first door, get in there, you uh, punch in a number on the phone, the room number, and then they dial you in. Right. None of this was explained to me. How would I know that this is what <laughs> I'm supposed to do? And I waited for a long time to figure out how are people getting in here. And when I saw that they were getting in by dialing in, I tried dialing this person's number. He, wa he wa wasn't picking up, so I just squeezed myself in with some of the student out <laughs> on the other side, went up to the second floor or whatever floor he was on, went up to his room, knocked many, many times. He wasn't there. Clearly, he had gone out for his weekend. 
And so I remember then waiting in the lobby for a very long time till he came back and I collected the key to go up to my room. So it was all uh, not a very welcoming entry into the country. So this was pre-cell phone, pre-Google, oh, yeah, yeah. pre-everything. Absolutely. So, so you had to know people. That's right. I mean, all I had to know was uh, this is uh, in the room number he is in. I need to go there, collect the key, and then I go back to my own room. And that's the start of my journey, which from there on was only getting interesting. And you came with less than $10 in your pocket. Yeah, I came with $8. The uh, government of India at that time was only offering you $8 for travel. Uh, they didn't have enough foreign exchange to give to students. So $8, and then you land up at, at the International Student Office and ask for a loan from the lady there? Yes, actually, yes, that's right. I think uh, Mary a day or next uh, day, I had to report to the foreign student director, uh, Mrs. Mary Campbell, who had been corresponding with me all along for a year, year and a half, in terms of offering all this uh, assistantship and free tuition and scholarship and everything. And uh, I just went in to visit with her, and she wanted to just say hello and see how was your trip and, you know, formalities. But I thought that I would collect my monies because uh, there was a, uh, the efficiency was costing, I think, uh, $150. So two people would be in one efficiency, which is a big room. So I needed $75 for that. And the health insurance was $15. So I needed at least $90 to even survive, even if I was not to eat. And I had only $8. So I told her when she was little, uh, you know, confused about why I was taking so long sitting and talking to her. I told her that where's my money? And she said, no, we give you the money once you finish your assistantship first month of work. And since I didn't have any, she loaned me enough money to survive for the first few weeks. Okay. So your first uh, six months were not that happy, but then you settled down. And then you became an accidental engineer once again because you saw one of your lab partners lived in a house. He had a car. He had a stereo system. Yes. And he said, that's the life I want to lead. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you go to colleges in India, mostly you're a student, you know, and you live in home and your parents take care of you and everything is provided for. Out here, when you are in master's and uh, graduate programs, PhD, some of your students are already married. And some of the students already have homes. And some of the students already are driving cars and living as if they are a regular life, which kind of was a little shocker to me. And also an eye-opener to say, my gosh, if they can do it, I can do it too. So that's how that whole journey started. So you went and told your professor that you don't want to do your PhD, but after master's you want to work. And That's this professor right. was kind enough to actually take you to a job interview? Well, he wasn't kind enough initially when I told him and broke this news to him. He was very upset about it because remember what they do is we were the cheap labor uh, that was being brought in as students and made to work on uh, very advanced topics of research that was funded by NASA or DARPA or uh, institutes like that. And they were getting funding from these institutes based on giving them a proposal that these three students are going to perform this work. And I was one of them. And when I told him I'm not going to perform the work, that really breaks his uh, promise to them. And he was upset about it initially. And it was because he was put in a position to find someone in college who was experienced enough to be brought into NCR because they had a project falling behind schedule is when he came and made a uh, deal with me saying, if you go and interview, whether you get a job or not, I will let you then go and not finish your PhD, but just the master's and be free to go buy a house and car and live the life you want to live. So NCR, may, many of us may not know, but in those days, it was one of the cutting edge companies because they oh, made- absolutely. They were uh, uh, what we call a monopoly in point of sale terminals. Uh, these are checkout registers. No matter which store you went to in America, when you're checking out with your groceries or clothes or whatever, and nine out of 10 times, the point of sale terminal was built by NCR. National Cash Register was the name of the company. Yeah, and that I believe it was established in 1884 and they made the first mechanical cash register. That's right. So Not only, actually IBM came out of NCR. Mr. Watson used to work in NCR and had a big feud with their management that led him to go spin out IBM, which became, you know, in its own way, the company we all know today. Got you. So you go and interview at NCR, you get the job, you know, you, you, like you pointed out before we did the interview that you stood head and shoulders above everybody. You got the job and you got a salary of how much? Uh, the starting salary that year for the graduate student was $16,000, uh, they told me. And uh, since I had worked in India for four years in continental devices, which is a semiconductor company, they said, we can't assess adequately, you know, what your performance there was or how important the work you did, but we'll give you $2,000 more. So they gave me $18,000. Was that a lot of money? 
Oh, for me, it was a hell of a lot of money because <laughs> I was making $325 per month when I came and became $350 six months later. Then when I became a graduate uh, teaching assistant, it became $900 uh, odd, uh, $645. My gosh, you jump from $645 per month to $18,000 a year, you feel very, very rich. It's, it's about $1,200, $1,300 per month yeah. you're getting. Okay, almost double your salary. Yes, exactly. Okay, so NCR was a short stint. Yes. How did you get into Intel then? Because there you are in the Midwest, in the cold, shivering Midwest. <laughs> yeah, NCR was a stop to my, on the way to my life, and it became really important stop, not only for giving me... I worked with a gentleman named Murray Trudell, Dr. Murray Trudell. He was from Bell Labs. He was a Canadian. He actually taught me a lot about how to do research. You know, he was a very really research-oriented guy, and we were doing research about how to make cash registers electronics from mechanical, you know, 100 years of this mechanical cash register, how to convert into electronics one. And we came up with some very innovative creative technologies, we call them non-volatile memories, and I did a uh, lot of work with him. It's during that cutting edge work I was doing with him, we came up with an invention which we patented that uh, got published and were invited by IEEE, which is a very uh, uh, important uh, electrical engineers association, to present that paper in Monterey, California. And he talked me into going and presenting it, even though really he and I had both worked on it, and he was a senior person, and I had never presented before, so I really didn't want to. But he talked me into going and presenting, and rest is all history, because not only the paper was very well received, the chairman of the session of that particular uh, conference that I t uh, presented in was an Intel guy who was doing similar work in that area, but they were not succeeding very well. And when he saw that we had already done some work in that area, he just picked me up and brought me to Intel. This is 1978? Yeah, this is 1978. His name was Bill Johnson. He was also a PhD from Stanford, and he was in charge of Intel's non-volatile on the uh, uh, side of the memory, electrically programmable, electrically reusable devices. And he's the one who took me out for lunch right after the paper and uh, got a promise out of me that uh, whenever I'm done with uh, wrapping up things at NCR, that I'll come and join Intel. What is non-volatile memory? Non-volatile memory is a memory where uh, when you lose the power or take the battery away or take whatever plug away, it will remember the information whatever you have kept in it. Okay, so the previous, whatever you're yes. working it's on. It's like it basically the USB you use in your camera today. When you take it out, all the photos are still kept in it. Okay. So they don't disappear even if you're not powered. You're just sitting on the desk. Okay. So then you come to Intel. And that changes your life completely because you get totally involved in making chips and microprocessors. Tell me, what's the difference between a chip and a microprocessor? Uh, a microprocessor is a chip. All, okay. all semiconductor devices are basically chips. That's a generic word for them. Microprocessor is just one category of devices or types of devices that are used for certain purpose. Uh, but the previous devices I worked with non-volatile memories, you know, that I... Uh, first few years at Intel were spent doing that, and then I shifted my gear and went into building microprocessors. Okay. What did you learn at Intel when I, you look at your 16 years? Yeah, I think I learned many things, uh, but one of the most uh, important things I learned was results count at the end of the day. It's not just what you do, but what you do meaningfully. That is, did you make a difference to the bottom line? It's not about just, you know, doing things for the sake of doing it is doing things that will commercially make profits. I think was a very important lesson for me because I was a very research-oriented guy until I got into doing that. So it was tied to money directly. Oh, absolutely uh, tied to money. And I think uh, the fairness about, you know, a lot of people use the word meritocracy, but Intel really practiced it. Uh, I know that because I came from University of Cincinnati. I only had a master's degree. Uh, I was this kid from India. None of that really mattered. They were just purely about who is making the difference to the bottom line. And if you are, then you are growing rapidly and getting more responsibility and more exciting things to do. So you probably ended up at least meeting or working with Robert Noyce, all the, the three great Intel Absolutely. people that come to I mind. I had this honor and privilege of uh, knowing Robert Noyce very briefly because he didn't really... Um, and he was uh, one of the co-founders. He, 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 yeah, he, he and Gordon Moore founded the company. Uh, he was a very colorful personality and uh, an amazing guy. I wish he, was, he had lived long enough, had long enough life to even uh, make bigger impact in the world. Uh, Gordon Moore, of course, you know, the greatest visionary that I have ever met. Uh, who, Moore's Law. 
not only Moore's law, the kind of things that you would hear when you were in a meeting with him that 30, 40, 50 years later become so true is mind boggling. And he would say them just as a matter of fact without even big, making big claims or doing a lot of spreadsheets. And of course, Andy Grove, you know, who was just the master of managing and strategy and connecting the dots and taking the company from what would have been a, you know, smaller, medium-sized company to something that really became the world's largest semiconductor company. So if I, if I hear what you're telling, what you learned at Intel is one is discipline, second is, you know, your product should be tied to money, and third is the focus and strategic focus and vision that all of them displayed. Absolutely. I think one of the things I learned from Andy Grove was how to connect the dots, how to take a, see what's happening in the environment and connect it in a way that you can take it forward and make it bigger and better. Why did you leave Intel? I left Intel for a variety of reasons, uh, but one of the reasons that really finally pushed me over was the fact that, you know, I was 45 years old at that time. and. I had been in Silicon Valley since 79, uh, which was, you know, when I was uh, 29 years old. So all these years, even back then, although it's taken a different realm altogether right now, startup was something that you fancied about, you know, joining a startup, starting a startup, uh, and this whole phenomenon of taking it public or selling it. And I would always wonder that if I did not do that by being right in the center of gravity of where this action is, what would it be like me in my 60s or 70s looking back and saying and feeling sour grace about why did I miss that chance? I think that finally tipped the balance and pushed me into taking a very baby step in a way, conservative step of going into a company which actually ex existed for about eight, nine years, so-called startup, usually don't exist that long, and also in the same arena that I was expert in. So it took a very conservative step, first step to say, let me try out and see how it goes. Which was the company? Next Gen. Next Gen. So this was, in what year are we talking about? We're talking about 95. So what was, the dot-com uh, heat had already started at that time. Not really, it was very fast. It started just at that time because I remember accepting the job offer in February and promising to join on May 1st because in April, you know, a lot of Intel stock option grant had, were coming due to me. And on May 1st, when I'm going into the company, the CEO of the company actually is on a road show, which I didn't know what stood for. And when I contacted him to say, where are you? He said, I'm on a road show taking company public, which I didn't think was really ready to be taken public based on the data I had seen just a few months prior to it. But he said, you know, you take it public when the timing is right. It's nothing to do with the data. Anyway, there was not much discussion. He was already taking the company public. And the reason he took company public at that time and I finally found out was just about at that time in May, June timeframe, Netscape had gone public. Netscape was a browser company that really took internet into a totally different realm as we know it because consumers could start using it. So yes, it was right coincident with the start of the internet.com. So NextGen got acquired by AMD yes. for? Uh, it, you know, they, they had a, a setup of both companies were public, so they had some kind of a setup. I don't recall exactly what uh, they had decided, but it finally got acquired on the day of uh, acquisition for about $800 million. Okay. Then you went and joined Silicon Spice. That's right. And Silicon Spice then ended up getting acquired for $1.2 by Broadcom. Broadcom. Yes. So... When you look back, did you ever think you'd be an entrepreneur? Because you're such a conservative guy, you don't like taking risks. You know, you like to make sure that there's enough money. So when you look back, are you stunned at what you have done? Well, I'm not stunned because to be honest with you, Next Gen wasn't my idea. Somebody else had started nine years ago and then I came in, I added value in terms of what I knew about it and how to make it more exciting because the chips they were developing, for example, were all proprietary. And I said, this will not fly. You need to make them compatible with industry standards, which was a huge breakthrough for them is why AMD bought them. So I think things of that nature help bring a lot of value. And, and my name and my background and my um, uh, having worked at Intel were all of great value to AMD in terms of acquisition. And uh, Silicon Spice also was started by three 20 something crowd from MIT. Uh, with the very crazy idea of reconfigurable computing, which uh, even though I spent a whole day going through it ahead of time, I did let them finish whatever they had started when I joined. They already were in uh, business for a few months or maybe a year, and uh, it didn't work out. 
I, I did, by the way, with the help of uh, some other senior members of the team, do create a second version of that company in a different product called Voice over IP and sold that to Broadcom for $1.2 billion. So to that extent, I do take credit for having done what I did in Silk and Spice, but you know, uh, it wasn't my idea. I only have a minute, so I just want to quickly ask you, what was the role that your wife played in your success? I think uh, it's a very, very crucial role that uh, actually never comes to forth. It's the steady hand that's behind you, always uh, giving you the affirmation that you need, both in the times uh, when you're related and times, especially when you are down in the dumps. And somebody who truly uh, you reflect from in the right sense. I recall there were moments where I would come in uh, and not be happy about something that's happened, only to be told that actually, in reality, it is my problem. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of an answer, very few people will give you, few people are in position to give you, and few people even have, fewer people still have the credibility and ability to give you and for you to listen and accept it. How did you resolve your differences? Because your late nights must have resulted in tension. Uh, no, I didn't have really that many late nights, to be honest with you. I think the world has gone crazy with the uh, advent of mobility and cell phone and smartphone. In our era, when you came home, you were homebody. There was nobody calling you, and you were not checking your emails and smartphones every two seconds and seeing what's going on. We had a much more easier life other than, I would say, every two, three years, we do what we call tape out a chip. That is a process of not translating from design into actual silicon. Now those three months are extremely hectic, both in terms of taping out, getting the silicon, it's not working, what's not working. Those days will be late nights, but I would say by and large, life is not as uh, crazy as it is these days. We, we ran out of time, so we never got to talk about you being an investor and an entrepreneur, but hopefully you'll come back another time. I'd love talk. to. So this is to quote Robert Noyce, who said, don't be encumbered by history, go off and do something wonderful. Absolutely. So I guess you're doing something wonderful with uh, being a CEO all over again? Yes, I am. Okay, I am. we'll have you back once again uh, and talk about your role as an investor and as an entrepreneur at, after a very long time. Yes, right? thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll be back again next week with another show. And if you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our YouTube channel. This program is made possible by Zoho Corporation.